In just a few decades, central Chad has become one of the fastest degrading ecological regions on the planet. Grasslands have vanished, traditional water points have dried up, and the edge of the Sahara pushes farther south each year. This is not merely the expansion of a desert. It is the fracture of a living system that had remained stable for thousands of years. Chad has tried many measures to slow this decline, restoring water points, building sand barriers, replanting local vegetation. But the biological forces that once kept the land alive have disappeared. And strangely, the answer for a dying landscape comes from the very animal species that had once been erased from the wild. So what makes the return of a species once extinct in the wild capable of altering the speed of the Sahara's expansion? That is what we will explore in this episode. The scimitar-horned oryx is one of the most extraordinarily extreme adapted species of the Sahara. Its silver-white body reflects sunlight to reduce heat. Its physiology allows its body temperature to rise without sweating, and its diet is based on roots, tubers, and vegetation, so dry that even livestock cannot use it. But what makes it an essential link in the ecosystem is not its endurance, but its movement behavior. Oryx wander dozens of kilometers each day in a fractal pattern similar to Przewalski's horses in Central Asia. Oryx wander dozens of kilometers each day in a fractal pattern similar to Przewalski's horses in Central Asia. They do not strip vegetation in large patches, but create small repeated disturbances in periodic cycles. Their digging with hooves and noses breaks the hard surface layer allowing air and moisture to reach deeper levels where microorganisms operate. When an oryx lies down in the 122 degrees Fahrenheit heat, its heavy body forms small depressions that retain rainwater, sometimes only a few millimeters, but enough to prolong moisture for several days. Seeds cling to their fur and fall along their travel routes, forming natural dispersal chains that no other species in the region can replicate on the same scale. All of these small processes form the engine that drives the semi-desert grasslands, distributing energy and nutrients throughout the system. A herd of 20 to 30 individuals can create thousands of disturbance points in a month, enough to keep the soil from falling into a state of biological dormancy. When the herd size declined and eventually vanished, the Sahara lost this engine. The collapse of the oryx population did not happen gradually, it happened as a break. Commercial hunting exploded in the mid-20th century, when their long, curved horns became high-value commodities in the Middle East and Europe. Large herds were easy to spot and could be wiped out in a single morning. At the same time, livestock grazing expanded taking over crucial water points, which under such harsh climate conditions was equivalent to blocking the survival routes of wild species. But the decisive factor that drove the oryx population to crash was habitat fragmentation caused by war, roads, and new settlements. Migration routes stretching tens of kilometers were cut into short segments. Large herds were divided into small groups of only a few individuals. In these small groups, a single drought or a single night of predation could wipe them out completely. In the year 2000, the IUCN declared the oryx extinct in the wild. But the Sahara ecosystem had felt that absence long before. When the oryx and other wide-ranging herbivores disappeared, the land lost its cycle of periodic disturbance. Microorganisms went dormant, grasses failed to return even after rain, and the wind began to strip away the last thin layer of soil in just a few sandstorm seasons. This is the degenerative feedback loop, similar to what once happened in North America when bison declined by 99%. Ecosystems do not collapse because they lack water, but because the soil loses its ability to hold it.
To understand the scale of the problem, we need to see the Sahara as a network. Semi-desert soil depends on the combination of four elements, soil microorganisms, porous surface structure, seed distribution, and animals that create disturbance. When animals disappear, the other three layers lose their function. Microorganisms have no oxygen to operate, seeds lie on the surface and die under the sun, the soil structure becomes compacted, causing rain to evaporate before it can seep in. Even when humans pump water or plant trees, these elements still do not operate because biological disturbance is missing. This is why many past restoration projects in the Sahel failed. They tried to recreate the surface of the ecosystem without restoring the forces that drive it from within. This degradation mechanism has been observed in many ecosystems around the world. In China, the northern grasslands only began to recover when Przewalski's horses returned and created a mosaic of grass patches. In Europe, European bison help maintain degraded forests by opening clearings where seeds can germinate. In Yellowstone, the return of wolves not only regulated elk numbers, but also altered their behavior, allowing vegetation to recover. In England, Scotland, beavers create water-retaining wetlands and reshape stream flows. Each of these species is a different link in the operating cycle of an ecosystem. In the Sahara, the oryx is that link. When the oryx disappeared from the wild, zoos and conservation centers became the species' last genetic reservoirs. But the number of remaining founder individuals was extremely limited, just over 100 worldwide. This raised a fundamental question in conservation. Can a species survive in the wild if its genetic diversity has been severely reduced? Scientists were forced to build a carefully managed breeding program using algorithms to maximize 90% of the original population's genetic diversity and avoid inbreeding. Many individuals were excluded from the program because of high genetic risk or physical traits unsuitable for extreme temperatures. These efforts spanned many decades and became one of the most significant examples in modern genetic conservation. The common thread among these projects is persistence and precision. A small mistake in genetic management can cause an entire species to collapse once reintroduced into the wild. In 2016, after establishing a sufficiently strong genetic structure, CHAD and the Sahara Conservation Fund launched one of the most ambitious reintroduction projects ever carried out in a desert region, bringing the oryx back to Wadi Rime, Wadi Ashem, a reserve nearly the size of Ireland. Each individual was transported by specialized cargo aircraft from Abu Dhabi to CHAD, a journey lasting many hours designed to minimize stress on the animals. Upon arrival in the semi-wild acclimatization area, they were fitted with Iridium GPS collars to monitor location, heart rate, and ambient temperature in real time. These collars transmit data through the global Iridium satellite network, enabling stable signal reception even in desert regions with no telecommunications infrastructure at all. The recording frequency can be as frequent as every few minutes, creating detailed movement maps that help scientists understand how the oryx survive extreme climates, identify potential migration routes, and determine areas of land beginning to recover. During the pre-release phase, the oryx were trained in the semi-wild enclosure, learning how to find water, move as a herd, avoid sandstorms, and adjust their activity to day-night cycles. These skills were once instinctive to their ancestors but had faded over many generations in captivity. Just a few months later, the first calf was born, a sign that the environment was suitable enough for life to continue. After the training period, the oryx were released in small groups to reduce stress and strengthen herd cohesion. These groups were guided into the semi-desert at dawn, 
when temperatures were lowest, allowing them to orient themselves without exhausting their bodies. And for the first time in more than three decades, wild hooves pressed into the sands of Wadi Rimi, Wadi Achim, marking the first shift in an ecosystem beginning to move again. But the return of the oryx was not welcomed by green pastures. The Sahara pushed back in the only way it knows, through extremes. Temperatures reached 120 degrees Fahrenheit for many consecutive days. Hot winds damaged monitoring equipment. Some calves did not survive the dry season, and predators quickly adapted to the new food source. Within a few months, nearly one-third of the first released individuals had died. But success comes not from resisting nature, but from understanding how nature operates. The research team in Chad did the same. They dug deep wells to supplement water sources, moved release sites farther south where grasslands still held structure, increased training time in the semi-wild enclosure, and released in larger herds to reduce predation risks. As a result, survival rates rose from 65% to 90% in just three years. When the oryx herds began moving steadily across large areas, small but foundational changes started to reappear in the soil. The shallow depressions left by their resting spots held rainwater for several more days, enough for native seeds to germinate. The disturbance points from their hooves became the places where the first microorganisms returned. As the soil surface began to retain water, insects appeared. As insects increased, small birds returned. When the lower tiers of the food web recovered, predators also stabilized, forming a complete nutrient cycle. This is a bottom-up restoration process, rebuilding an ecosystem by restoring soil layers and microorganisms before large plants can take root. This is also the mechanism behind the success of many global projects. European bison opening forest gaps for seedlings, beavers creating ponds that help plants withstand drought, Kshowalski's horses reactivating nutrient-poor soils. However, the oryx has a unique advantage. It restores soil in places where trees cannot survive, wolves cannot persist, and beavers cannot live. For that reason, it becomes one of the few species capable of rebuilding land along the margins of the Sahara. By 2023, more than 500 oryx were living in the wild, including over 150 born without human intervention. This is an important milestone showing that the herd has passed the dependent phase and is forming a self-sustaining population. Native grass structure has reappeared in areas once considered dead land. Climate vegetation simulation models show that the spread of the Sahara slows significantly in regions where oryx herds move frequently. This success has created a domino effect across North Africa. Niger has launched an Adax oryx reintroduction project. Tunisia and Morocco have begun restoring native herbivore species. Algeria has established cross-border migration corridors. The story of the oryx herds in Chad reveals a familiar paradox in ecological restoration. Trees cannot rebuild an ecosystem, only animals can do that. Many large-scale tree planting projects failed, not because the trees were weak, but because the system beneath the ground was already dead. No microorganisms, no nutrients, and no cycles of disturbance. If the current reintroduction rate and birth rate are maintained, Modeling projections show that by 2035, the oryx population in the Sahel could reach 2,000 to 3,000 individuals, a number large enough to function as a self-sustaining population and substantial enough to create ecological impacts at a regional scale. By 2050, the spread of the Sahara across central Chad could decrease by 15 to 30 percent, not because the desert recedes, but because the soil begins to retain water longer, vegetation structure becomes more stable, and native species can endure harsh dry seasons. A single herd cannot save a continent,
but it can change the direction in which a landscape operates. And that has always been the starting point of every major restoration in natural history. When we look at the oryx today, the question is no longer whether one species can make a difference, but among the species we have lost, which missing link will be the next force strong enough to awaken a sleeping ecosystem.